Hey, welcome to section 2.4. Here in section 2.4 they want to introduce us to a, a, what they call a library of functions, some very kind of core functions that they want us to make sure that we're familiar with. And so I'll demonstrate each one, although I think most if not all are familiar to you. The first is the function f of x equals x squared. I think we all know that this is a parabola, right, that's centered at 0, 0 and is completely symmetric about the y-axis. So regardless of how lame I draw it, we got this upwards opening parabola um, as you have this x squared graph that's centered at 0, 0. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at this graph being shifted in future sections. And, um, and you know, as long as we know the general shape, we, if we know how it moves, then we just take that same general shape and move it to wherever it needs to be, because our goal is to have very quick pictures of what's going on. The second graph that I want to show you is the absolute value graph. And so if you start plugging in points, you're thinking, well, let me plug in zero. Obviously, you're going to get zero. With one, you get one. With negative one, you also get one. With two, you would get two and with negative two you get the same negative two what you'll quickly find out is you have these 45 degree lines coming right up there making this V shape that goes on forever also completely symmetric about the Y axis um, and so we have that function that we want to expose you to we have the cube function X cubed Maybe you know what this one looks like. We hope so. That in your intermediate algebra class, they took the time to show you these functions. Obviously, 0 cubed is 0. 1 cubed is 1. 2 cubed, though, is all the way up to 8. And so we get way up there. So we get really big, really quick. And what happens on the other side is, well, we completely mirror it in this other column, right? Go two out, you're down eight. We get something like this. And so we're symmetric about the origin um, as we look at that because of the quadrant placements there. Um, and so that's the f of x equals x cubed function right there. Um, and so we just, again, want to know what that looks like. It's real critical point is 0, 0, being right at that bend point. This one, the absolute value of x critical point is also 0, 0. So we'll just hinge off of that. There's some other ones that we like you to know about. Um, f of x is equal to the square root of x. We'd love for you to know what that is like. Well, you know that the domain of this function is from 0 forward. You can't plug in a negative, right? So the domain is from 0 to infinity just because of the setup. That's the principal square root. And so it starts at 0, and then it just goes up like this. It actually steadily increases, but it looks like it's leveling off. But it actually just keeps going up to infinity. The, the problem not the problem, but the reality is as you get bigger and bigger to get to the next perfect square, it takes a long distance to go. Okay, and so it kind of feels like it's leveling off, but it really isn't. Um, and then we have the f of x is equal to the cubed root of x would be one that they'd want you to know and would reference. Um, in this case, you can plug in negatives. You can take the cubed root of anything. And so if we think about that, it's going to go through 0, 0. And the cubed root of 1 is 1. But now i got to go way out to 8 just to get up to 2. And so it's very flat right here. So essentially, it's this x cubed curve that's up in the upper right-hand corner turned on its side. And so we would have a very similar picture over here. So that's what the x cubed looks like. We're looking for rough sketches, nothing drastic in there. A few other functions. Certainly you know what this looks like, y equals x. You've known this since pre-algebra. It's a line, right? y equals x is a line that goes um, right through 0, 0, and is a 45-degree line. They'll, they'll may reference that. In fact, I'm sure they do. They also do something like this, y equals 5, that constant function. And I apologize, I went to y notation. Probably should not have. They'll probably keep everything in function notation. So let me change these y's to their function equivalents, f of x. 
right? From chapter two of an intermediate algebra textbook, we'd be introduced to functions right away. So f of x is equal to five. They call this the constant function because you're at the constant value of five no matter what x is you plug in. And the last one that we need to look at, maybe I'll we'll give it a little bit more space than what's there in the right hand corner. f of x is equal to one over x. So if we think about this, this has um, a place that where we're undefined. Its domain is from minus infinity to zero and then jumping to the other side. We can't plug in zero. And whenever we can't plug something in, because it makes it undefined, that's what we call an asymptote. And so it has this vertical asymptote right here at zero. And if you play around with numbers, as you let x get bigger and bigger, like a thousand, a million, you get one over a thousand, one over a million, one over a billion, you get really small, but never zero. And so what this graph looks like is it's getting closer and closer to the x-axis but actually never touching it. In fact later on we'll, we'll be able to determine that there's a horizontal asymptote here. We'll have a whole chapter devoted to rational functions and their graphs because they're so awesome. And then we'd have a similar piece down here actually completely mirrored. Think about why it's going up to infinity here. We're plugging in things like one-tenth. Well, the flip of one-tenth is ten. Flip of one one-hundredth is a hundred. And so we're getting, as we get closer and closer to zero, ten, a hundred, a thousand, a million, a billion, as high as we want to go as we get closer and closer to zero. So that's what those functions look like and what they're going to have us do. This, And just knowing these functions solves about half of the 20 problems that are in the homework. They'll just reference them and make sure you can identify which ones are which. And so it should go pretty quickly for that first half. The second half of problems in this 2.4 section will, um, some of them will, actually most of them will hinge on what we call piecewise functions. So let me give you an example. So there's no shifting that I can remember in this section. They're saving that to 2.5. They just want us familiar with this library of functions. So here's an example for us. I'll call it example number one. Okay, so for example number one, they're giving us a function f of x is equal to x squared 1 or 3x plus 4. Well, it's going to be equal x squared if x is less than 0. It's going to equal 1 if x is equal to 0. And it's going to equal 3x plus 4 if x is greater than uh, 0. And so they're asking us to graph that. No problem. So what we want to do is graph what we can. So we just handle it one piece at a time. So they call this, I'll write it up here, a piecewise defined function or a piecewise function. Very, very popular to use as you go into your calculus sequence because a lot of calculus is based upon limits and having you have a good understanding of limits in the very beginning will be healthy. And so they often use piecewise functions in order to stress that. So as we look at this function, what we know is, well, let's take part number one. And because I can do highlights here and match those highlights in color, I'm going to highlight um, x squared in yellow. Okay, so this is only going to be x squared if we're less than 0. So we get the x squared graph, which we know what it looks like. That x squared graph is a full parabola, but only when we're less than 0. So it looks just like this, and it comes all the way up to that 0. Now, I don't know how well you can see that, but I put an open circle there. There's an open circle, which means it doesn't actually get to the 0, but gets as close as it can to that 0. The next part I'm going to highlight is in green. So let me grab the highlighter and put green. It's going to be flat out 1. The function value is going to be 1 if x is 0. Okay, so let's go here and we'll go up to the level 1. There is another point on my function. See that dot right above it? That is a part of my function. That's the green piece of the function. And then I'll do the last one in a red highlight or in red pen. And what is that? That's 3x plus 4 as x is greater than 0. So here's what I would do. 
it doesn't actually obtain zero but we need to go right up to that point so I would plug in zero and realize when I plug in zero I get out four okay you and now I don't actually get there so I'm doing another open circle there hopefully you see that as an open circle and not a solid dot like the green dot because it doesn't get there so it follows the yellow line up until zero then jumps to the green dot and then we'll jump on this this red and we know what that red thing is it's a line it's going through four zero four and has a slope of three so what does the slope of three mean up three and over to the right one put a dot and you just get this nice sketch of a line coming right up here that is the graph of the piecewise function I'm going to take off this part that says open circle. That's the graph of that piecewise function. And so they'll use this to talk about limits. This one, if you look at it, the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit don't kind of match. You may not be understanding what I'm saying right now just because we haven't talked about limits, but the power is going to be in giving you a quick visual interpretation. So they're going to have you do some where you're just graphing, maybe one or two. Let's practice again. Let me go to the next piecewise function that I saw. Come back here. This will be example two. And all of these are in 2.4 homework. And you can see some good um, examples in the book as well. So they're going to give us a function. f of x is equal to and negative 3x plus 4 if x is less than 1. I'm going to be smart here. I'm going to switch colors. And then it's going to be 2x minus 1 if x is greater than or equal to 1. Okay. So how would we do this? So th here's what they would like to know. They would like to ask us the domain, the intercepts, and the graph and then the range based upon that graph. So those are the four things that they want, and they're asking for them in that order, but I, from a, hey, I'm your instructor, I'm your friend standpoint, I think it's far better to do the graph first. So even if they force you to answer the domain question first, on a piece of paper, I would highly recommend doing the graph. It will take you a, just a little bit of time, um, but be very worthwhile. So let me come here and start graphing this guy out. So everything hinges off of when x is 1. So let's go out there. So let's worry about the black line first. When x is 1, what is y for the black line? So I'm going to focus on the equation y equals negative 3x plus 4. When x is 1, what's y? And when x is 1, you can easily see that y is 1. Now, we don't actually obtain that point because we don't actually get to the 1. We're strictly less than 1. Let me plug in a number, another number that's less than 1. Let's plug in 0. When we plug in 0 for x, what do we get out for y? Well, we get 4 out. Well, that's enough to graph the line. We now know what this line looks like. It's going to that open circle and going right through that solid dot. There's that black part of the piecewise defined function. Now let's do the red part. So I'm going to erase what I've done down here. And we're going to go do the red line. Now as we do the red line, we're doing the same thing, except we're focusing on the red line. So we do absolutely want to know what x is, what the value is when x is 1. Apologize, what y is when x is 1. So if I plug 1 in, I get 2 times 1, which is 2, minus 1, which is 1. So we come in and we actually fill that hole. That happens every once in a while, but it happened in this case. That's awesome. That'll absolutely be something that you do early on in your calculus class in order to investigate limits. And they'll have this similar type of example. Now personally, I would go plug in 2. I plug in something that's in the range, or sorry, in the domain of this line, so I can just draw it that way. And if I plug in a 2, I get 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 1, which is 3. And so at 2, I'm up at 3. And so we're drawing this line right here, and they go on forever. 
That's what this piecewise defined function looks like. So take a look at it. This is why I'm asking you to do the graph first. What's the domain? The domain, and I'll go back to black, the domain is from negative infinity to infinity. We're completely defined everywhere. We can even see that before we ever get started. What x's are defined? All of them, right? We're, we define values less than 1, and we define values 1 and greater. We didn't need to wait to see that. That's not the power. The power really is that you don't waste your time with the intercepts. Do you see what the intercept is? First of all, we can see right away that there are no there are no x-intercepts. It would have been a waste of time to set um, either one of these equal to zero. It, we would have gone through some work and it would have given us a number, but the number wouldn't have fallen in its domain. And so it's easier to see it and realize, okay, there are no x-intercepts. And we already have the y-intercept shown. And the y-intercept is at 0, 4. So perfect. We can do that. Um, and get that intercept in there. The graph we have done. And what's the range? Well, what's the lowest value obtained? Well, the lowest value obtained is the y value of 1. And we can go as high as we want. So that's why I'm really suggesting that you do the graph first. Um, another example, same type of thing, same four questions. But just to give you another example in there. I think this is example number 3. f of x is equal to, and we'll make this first function black, 2x if x is between negative 1 and 0, not including the 0, and x cubed if, I should put an if here, I guess, if x is greater than or equal to zero. Awesome. And so, apologize, I forgot. So let me highlight this guy in red. So when I do it, I'll do it in red. But let's go do the graph. That's what I would suggest to do first before you go and answer those questions. Let's worry about the black one. Well, you know what this thing looks like. It's that V-shaped type of thing. The two is just going to adjust it a little bit, but let's plug in some numbers. We absolutely need to know where we're at at negative 1. So at negative 1, we're going to get, if I focus on y equals the absolute value of 2x, if I let x be negative 1, then what we're going to have is the absolute value of 2 times negative 1, which is the absolute value of negative 2, which is 2. If I let x be 0, I'm going to go through 0. So it's going to be that V shape. Now, I did something wrong there. So let me back that off. Because what I need to do there is an open circle because it doesn't actually go to 0. Right? It gets as close as I want. But we have this line that connects those two. And just that, it stops right there. There's nothing to find below negative 1. So your domain is from negative 1 forward. Hey, x cubed. Let's go to the x cubed function. So let me grab my eraser. Get rid of all of this. I'll move this up a little bit. Let's go look at the x cubed function. Well, we definitely want to plug in 0. Well, actually, we know what this thing looks like. Why even plug in anything? We start at 0, and so it's going to come fill in that hole. And we know that this guy looks like this, right? It goes through 1, 1, and then goes all the way up to 2, 8, but it looks just like that. Let's go answer some questions. What's the domain? Oh, I can leave it in red. What's the domain? Well, we see it. It's from negative 1 forward. What are the intercepts? Well, there's only one intercept, 0, 0. It's both an x and y intercept at the same time. The graph, see above. And the range. Well, how low do we get? We get to zero and we obtain it, and we can go as high as we want. So, kind of fun, right? Filling in all of these things. 
The only other thing I think I need to show you is I saw it referred to at the very end of the problem set. They give this function f of x is equal to int x. So they call this the greatest I'll put the x in parentheses. They call this the greatest integer function. So what it's designed to do is give you the greatest integer um, that lies below the number, or that is less than or equal to the number. So the greatest integer function, so int x gives the largest integer less than or equal to x. Okay, so what are we talking about? f of 3, int 3, would be, well, the greatest integer less than or equal to 3. So the greatest integer less than or equal to 3 is 3. Uh, 3.1. int 3.1. What's the greatest integer less than or equal to 3.1? 3. f of 3.9. int of 3.9. What's the greatest integer less than or equal to 3.9? 3. Right? And so it stays constant at 3 until you get plug in 4. Right? I had to put 4.0. I didn't need to do that. int of 4 would be 4. Right? f of 3.98 is the int of 3.98, which is 3. So where we get some people messed up is f of negative 1.2. What's the greatest integer less than or equal to negative 1.2? int of negative 1.2. Hopefully you realize, oh, that's negative, um, negative 2. Apologize, it's negative 2. It's not negative 1. Negative 1 is bigger than negative than 1.2. It's got to be less than or equal to. And so if you look at a number line and you think, okay, here's negative 1, here's negative 2, here's negative 1.2, you need the greatest integer less than or equal to it, it's negative 2. So on the negative side, it kind of changes its position. Not really, and not if you're thinking about it in its true definition. But keep that in the back of your mind for when they grab the greatest integer function. Its graph looks something like this. Like its graph makes complete sense. Right? So if you pick numbers, if you pick 0, it's going to be 0. And anything up to 1.9 or 1.99 or 1.999 is going to all be mapped back to 0. Oh, sorry. I said one point. I should have said 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.9, 0 0.99, all the way up to that. So let me make that a little bit clearer what's happening at that crux level. Um, whoops. That's maybe good, actually, that I did that, that I erased the whole thing. So... Um, I'm going to come in here and in blue put the greatest integer function. At 0, it's 0. At 1, it jumps. Anything in here is being mapped down to 0. But at, once you get to 1, it jumps up to 1 and continues in a straight line until you get to 2. And then it jumps up to 2. And they call this a stair step function. Right? This is 2. This is 3. Um, but 2.9 would be sent back down to 2. And then it would continue that stair step here. If you're at negative 0.9 or even negative 0.1, you're going to be sent down to negative 1. And so you'll be on this level right here. So it's this nice stair step type of function. And so they want you to just expose that from a thinking element, right? And they'll ask you some questions in regards to that towards the end of the section. So everything's trying to make us think better and think mathematically, and that you can be really successful at it. So let me know if there's questions or concerns, either by email or coming to the Zoom office hours. Thanks so much.